So I did send out a message yesterday in um, Remind, right? And I asked you guys to come into uh, Canvas and try to complete that ISLO assignment yesterday if you could. I was under the impression that they were due yesterday. That's why I said, go in there and get it done today, right? However, apparently my portion of what I have to do for that assignment was due yesterday, okay? In which I did, so we're good. You guys actually still have more time to get it done, okay? So if you were able to get it in there and get it done yesterday, thank you. I'll probably give you like two more bonus points just because you did it on time when I asked the first time. <laughs> but if you didn't get it in there on time, then um, you still have the opportunity to get in there and get the seven bonus points, okay? So I just wanted to explain it a little bit because there are a couple of people, not from this class, but I think someone from the online class, I think two people from the online class did the form incorrectly. And if you don't do it correctly, I can't turn it in. And then therefore there was no point in you doing it, okay? So I won't give you the bonus points if you're not doing the form correctly, okay? Your answers is not what I mean by is it correct or not, okay? There, if I'm gonna click on it so you can see what I'm talking about. So in there, it says that you need these three bits of information to do the form. If any one of those three pieces of information is incorrect, your form does not count, okay? It won't get turned in because it doesn't have the right identifying information, okay? So I did have somebody had all of the right information. They had their name, they had their banner ID correct. They had the course and the section number correct, but they put one, two, three, four, five for the CRN. The CRN is not one, two, three, four, five for this class. That could be like a science class in a totally different department. I have no idea what class has a CRN of one, two, three, four, five, but it's not mine, okay? So if that CRN number is not correct, you don't get those bonus points, okay? So make sure that you are using the correct CRN. I did get some text messages later uh, yesterday asking me, where is the CRN? And so I just replied back, you know, where you can find it. If you go to the course syllabus here, the biggest hint I'll tell you in the text is that it's a five digit number. So go to your syllabus and find the five digit number, okay? It's at the top. So if I click on syllabus, I'm gonna open it in a new tab. And at the very, very top, you have all this stuff, right? All this information up here. You'll notice that the course that we're talking about, this is the course number that you need to be using, okay? So you need to be using 1414. It tells you the section number right there, 061. And then this five digit number right there is the CRN, okay? So when you are filling out that form, you do need to use these bits of information, okay? You also need to make sure you have the right banner ID. Do not be typing in your social, it's the same number of numbers, but don't be putting in your social, okay? It needs to be your banner ID and it has to be the correct banner ID. I have to verify that all the information is correct before I can actually submit your, your paperwork forward to the department. So again, make sure that you're filling out that form correctly. Once you have that information, you're just gonna read the little scenario. The math that's involved in this is not college level math. I mean, if you took, if you know how to use a basic calculator that says add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you should be able to do this problem, okay? Um, so it's not that complicated, don't think. I'm glad we have not talked about, um, <laughs> there's some stuff that has to do with like interest and stuff. We're gonna learn it when we get to chapter four and it's like complicated. But if you notice like a lot of these things, um, it doesn't say it in here exactly, but none of this is that complicated process that we're gonna learn in chapter four. This one is super, super basic, okay? So just read through the scenario. Once you've read through the scenario, you can go through step two and step three just so you have more information. Um, but I would read that scenario and then the rubric, I would go over it, just me personally, because the whole point of this assessment is so that the college can gauge whether or not their, the departments are teaching critical thinking, right? I think I already mentioned to you guys how critical thinking is important, especially in your guys' field. But y'all being engineers, I mean, I don't want you to build a bridge and a bridge and you'll fall down because you don't think, right? <laughs> so 
we want you to think critically, okay? But we also have to figure out whether or not we're doing a good job, what we can do to improve, things like that. We need to know our baseline to know if we're improving, okay? So we have to know whether or not you guys are already capable of critically thinking or not, okay? So this is what I would go through. I wouldn't even bother myself with emerging or non-demonstrated. You don't want to be one of those people. You want to be the ones that actually has critical thought, right? So go in there and look and see what they're looking for, okay? Just read the little pieces about what is it they're, asking, they're wanting from you, okay? Once you know what they're wanting from you, then you know how to write an answer that will fit all of that description, right? Okay, they, they made me do it, so sorry, my face again. Um, but they made me make the video on how to fill out this form. So it's a quick video. I don't think it's very long. I think I have to click it in order to see how long it is. It's like 10 minutes. But it's literally just me telling you how to fill out the form. Okay. So it tells you how to type in all the math symbols if you need to type in math symbols. Um, and it just goes through that process. Here's the part where you need all that information. If this top part is not filled out complete correctly, I can't give you the bonus points. Okay. Because I can't turn in your submission. However, here, make sure you are selecting my name. It is Lopez. I am the only Lopez in there, so make sure you click it there, okay? Um, and then over here is where you actually show your computation for the scenario. So you'll show your computation for each one of those options, and then you'll write a paragraph, you know, answering the question or whatnot, okay? I'm not gonna go through it because I can't help you or give you any ideas or anything, so. <laughs> Just understand that you're gonna read all that information that's in step one, and then you wanna come down here and fill out the rest of the form, okay? You can scribble it all over your paper and then just make sure whatever you wrote on your paper, you type it in this form, okay? When you're done, you'll hit submit at the bottom, and then that will email you and it will email me. And then I'll review that email to see if all the information is correct. If it's not, I will email you again, or not even email you, I'll send you a text to remind and tell you, no, this was wrong, you need to do it again, okay? So don't throw away your paper. <laughs> if you scribbled all this stuff down and you filled out the form wrong, you still have it, right? You still have that information with you, okay? Um, I have received a few of them yesterday, but um, I haven't gone in this morning yet and tallied everyone that's done it and done it correctly. So I will do that as soon as I get back to the office. Um, I'll tally who's done it, who's done it correctly, and then those that I had not done it correctly, I will be messaging in my mind, okay? And so then you'll know whether or not you gotta do it over again or not. Okay, there is no deadline in there, but it will disappear eventually, okay? I'll just literally click this button and you'll, you'll never see it again, okay? It really needs to be done by, I have to turn them in on the 13th. So I need you guys to do them by the 12th, okay? So if you have not done it already, make sure you do it by the 12th. I will probably send out a reminder around the 8th. So that way, anyone who hasn't done it yet I can try to give you one last shot at getting those points um, over the weekend, and then that's it. It's going to stop on the call. Okay. Any good questions? No? Okay. So remember, your CRN number is right there. If you don't want to go looking for it, it's already there. Okay. Okay. And you should do it, right? Who's gonna turn down free seven points? Come on now, right? Please do it. <laughs> and they're test points, so that's even better. Um, okay, let's go back to our camera. There we go. So we are gonna go over 2.4. I know we don't have like a whole lot of time. We have like maybe 30 minutes. It may or may not take us that long to finish this one because really all this section is, is just to kind of let you see all those different basic functions, okay? So we're not really gonna be doing a whole lot in this section. It's really just like an introduction to what is all going on with the different graphs. And look at all the graphs that they're gonna show you. We know about lines, right? We're gonna talk about lines a little bit again to jog back our memory. They're gonna talk about squaring functions, which are the quadratics, right? We're gonna talk about cubics. Cubics are what? They're the cube root kind of things, right? We're gonna talk about the square root functions, and we're even gonna talk about the reciprocal functions, which is like this. 
And then we're even going to talk about some more because there's actually eight of them. And right now they've only mentioned one, two, three, four, five, right? There's three more that's missing, okay? But they're called parent functions. And there's eight of them and we're going to show you all of them, okay? Essentially what it is, is you should be able to look at a function and depending on what kind of function it is in your brain, you should already have an idea of what it's going to look like. You may not know all the specific characteristics of it, right? But you should know whether it's going to look like a U, whether it's going to look like a V, whether it's going to look like a sideways parabola, you should know kind of what it looks like, okay? And that's what they mean by parent function, okay? So they will show us all those graphs in a little bit. And then of course, you could always chunk whichever pieces of any function you want together and make a new function, and those are called piecewise functions, okay? So you can always grab like a little piece of this graph, a little piece of that graph, and a little piece of this graph and put them on the same axis. And now you have chunks, right? You have a piecewise function. Okay. So it says one of the goals in this text is to enable you to recognize those basic shapes of graphs of different functions. For instance, you know that the graph of a linear function, if it looks like this, right, is a line. You know that it looks like a line. Now, I don't know whether it's got a positive slope, a negative slope, if it's super, super steep, or has like a very low incline, okay? I have no idea what exactly it's going to look like, right? But I know the shape of it should be a line, right? That's what I mean by knowing those basic graphs, okay? You should know those shapes. We know that we'll have a slope of A, whatever's in front of the X is usually your slope. And then we also know that if I plug in zero, right, isn't this going to go away? And so my, my y-intercept should be at B, okay? That's just basic information about lines. So what other kinds of information could we get from that, right? So it says to graph the linear equation has the following characteristics. The domain of a function is negative infinity to infinity, right? It's a line, doesn't it go forever in both directions, right? So it's going to the left forever and it's going to the right forever which is why this is the domain, okay? When m is not equal to zero, the range of the function is set to all real numbers. Isn't it going up forever and down forever as well, right? That's the range value. So the range is also negative infinity to infinity. It's just down to negative infinity and up to positive infinity. We also know that it has an x-intercept and it has this, but where the heck did they get that, right? So remember what x-intercepts are. X-intercepts are when you take the equation, the function, and you equal it to zero, right? And if I took that function and I equaled it to zero, I would have to minus b on both sides, and then I eventually would have to divide by a, wouldn't I? Okay, and so you get this value. Now we already know that the number in front of a is your slope. So instead of putting a here, they put an m, but it could be either or, okay? I mean, they gave us the function with an a, not an m, right? Why they chose to put an M, I have no idea. That was what the function looked like. And then of course, if I plug in zero, I get B for the Y. Now when you're, um, again, the M, it should be an A. When the A is greater than zero, then we know that it's going to be a decreasing, it's gonna have a negative slope, or sorry, it's increasing when A is positive, it will have a positive slope. And then when A is negative, it actually decreases, it goes downward, right? And if the A equals zero, then it has no slope, which means it's a flat line. And we know that flat lines mean they're constant. Right? Okay, so that's linears. They're gonna give me an example of something. And then I think we're gonna go into the next concept. Not a whole lot going on in this section. So it says, write the linear function f for which you have this point and this point. Now, this is the fancy notation, okay? What we wanna do is we wanna put that fancy notation in just like a regular point like this, okay? So you have to remember that what's inside here is the x value, right? And so when you plug in the x value, what comes out? The y value, right? So X goes in, Y comes out. So that's why they have the point labeled like this, right? The X is one, 
and the y that came out was three. Now for the second point, here you have a four that's going into the function and out is coming the y value of zero. So now you have the point four and zero, okay? Once you have them in these points, you gotta go back to all your linear information and you have to remember, I need two bits of information in order to um, <clears throat> give you the equation of the line. I need A and I need B, right? You have to know those two pieces of information. We know that A is the same as the slope and you know the formula for slope. We just talked about that in the last section, right? So you just plug in all the numbers where they belong, put out all the X values where they belong, do your computations, and you end up with that the A value or the slope is negative one. So that tells me so far, I know my function will look like this. One more piece of information I'm missing, and that is the B. <coughs> Excuse me. Remember that in order for you to figure out the B, you have to use one of the points. Now it doesn't matter whether you use the one and the three or you use the four and the zero. It really makes no difference. But on me personally, if I can plug in zero, I prefer to do that <laughs> than to plug in other numbers, okay? So in order for me to find the B, I'm gonna first change this because I don't like it. And then I'm gonna plug in that point four comma zero. So y is the zero and x is the four. So then I get zero equals, this will turn out to be negative four and then plus b, right? And then how do I solve for b? So I'm gonna add four to both sides and then I get that positive four equals B. And so then now I know the whole equation. I know the whole function is gonna be negative one for A and positive four for B. And you can clean that up. You can just write negative X plus four, right? You never write the one coefficient, okay? but there was a process that we had to do to get that equation. Now I'm hoping that that looks familiar because it should, but if it doesn't, it looks brand new. Well, now you have an example, right? <laughs> okay, so they're just going through the same thing on the other page. I just didn't want to turn it over. They use the point slope formula. If that's the way you did it back in the day, you can do it this way. I'll leave you to look at this and review it on your own. This is another way to do it. I didn't do it this way, did I? I did it different. I just went and found the B, didn't I? Okay. So I did it a little bit different than that way. But that is another alternative. I've always told you guys there's always multiple ways to do stuff, right? And as long as you're not doing anything wrong, you're good. So now, if you wanted to graph it, that's the way you would graph it. You, I would literally just draw those two points that they gave you. What was it? One and three, and then four and zero, and then just connect the dots. That's how you would graph it. Okay. And you know it's supposed to look like a line, so it literally just grab something straight and draw it. Okay. Next one up is the squaring function. So before we talk about that, <clears throat> it looks like they're talking about the constant function. So when you basically just have y equals a number, okay? And we know that that's the fancy notation of this. Now that just means it's gonna be constant. It does go from left to right forever. So the domain would still be that negative infinity to infinity stuff, but the range would only be one number or one number only. And it's whatever that, that y value that was there in the equation right? Whatever that y value was, it's the only y value for the whole graph. It doesn't ever go up or down or nothing, okay? And so that's basically it for this one. Not a whole lot going on. Um, let's see here. It says, what is it talking about? Oh, 
The graph of a constant function is a horizontal line as shown right there. It says the identity function has the form f of x equals x. Okay, so it's different from the constant function. So this was the constant function, right? Constant function looks like this. The identity function looks like this. Okay. And that is literally a line where the slope is what? Not constant. That's not the right word. But couldn't I write this like this? Is that the same thing as x? It is, right? It's more complicated looking, but it's, it's the same thing as x. But I know that the a value, which is the slope, is 1. And I know that the y-intercept is what? It's 0. OK? And so if I graph that little guy, I get this, right? The y-intercept is zero. And if you go up one and over one, you get another point. If you keep doing it, I could get all the points, right? But that is the graph of it, okay? Now, you can do things to this by putting numbers in there, right? If I multiply by something, if I divide by something, that's gonna, that's gonna affect the A value. If I add or subtract something, that's going to affect the y-intercept, right? Those things that I do to the x, those are called transformations. And that's a whole other section that we'll get to next time, OK? But um, that's why the only bare part of the line is just the x, OK? And you can manipulate that x to get all the other kinds of lines that there are, OK? And it's the same with the squaring function and the cubing function and all of those. The main part is the x squared, but if I do stuff to it, it'll get you all the graphs of anything that has an x squared in it, okay? So the squaring function, of course, x squared, right? It does have a U shape. It's not exactly like a U, because notice this U looks like they're going straight upward, right? And if you did watch the 3.1, I tell you that it's not straight upward, it is angled out so that those sides are going up and out, right? They're not just going straight vertically up, like this U looking thing right here. Okay. We use that U shape slightly, right? <laughs> it's either a valley, to me, this is a valley, or it's a hill, right? That's the way it's going to look. Okay. And in that section, you learn what makes it look like this versus looking like that. But there's a whole bunch of different things going on with the spring function. Okay. The domain, regardless of which way it opens, it is going left forever and right forever in both of these scenarios. So the domain is still the negative infinity to infinity. The range depends, okay? It says it's the set of all non-negative real numbers. For that one, it is. Because for this, it's centered at the origin, and then it goes upward like that. They have it down there if you want a better graph, because I draw horribly but they have the graph down on the other page, okay? But if the graph looks like this, okay, then notice that it says that the range is all non-negative numbers. <laughs> is zero negative? <coughs> no. So the range is from zero to infinity. <coughs> okay. But we have a bracket there because there's a problem that way, right? And that's not increasing, decreasing, or constant, is it? We know for increasing, decreasing, or constant, we're not allowed to put the bracket, right? Okay, and then it talks about the function being even. I don't think we've even talked about <coughs> what makes a function even or not even, but I can mention it now. Not that we do too much with that information, but every now and then they do ask you if it's even or odd. When you get to trig, it's important whether it's even or odd. But for right now, it's not. But even just basically means that it reflects itself over the y-axis. So if you look at the y-axis, doesn't it look like a mirror image of itself with respect to the y-axis? That's what an even function is. Okay. An odd function means if I mirror it over the y and then over the x, then that's an odd function. There does exist one, and we'll talk about it 
if we get there in time. <laughs> okay, and then of course it has the intercept at zero, zero, right? So this is just all the graph again, okay? So we know that for a regular x squared, just y equals x squared, it's actually decreasing on this side, right? Which is this interval. And then it's increasing on the other side, which is that interval. And we also know that it has symmetry with respect to the y-axis. That is exactly the same information of y is even, okay? So it's really are the same statements. So I don't know why they did it twice. And then the graph has a relative minimum. Right there, there's a valley and it's a zero, zero, okay? It's just explaining to you the basic information. We're not doing anything with it just yet. So you may have a problem in the homework that tells you basically to match like all the parent functions. Like this one is the graph of what? This one's the graph of what? This one's the graph of what? And so on, okay? So we're gonna get into a few more, cubic, square root, and reciprocal. So for the cubic function, I hate that I have it down here, but it's down here. This is what it looks like. To me, that looks like one of the modern chairs <laughs> where it's like super slippery and just slide off of this darn thing, right? But it reminds me of a chair, okay? And so it's got this curve. Also, what you can do is you can visualize it as like half of a parabola opening upward and then the other half opening down, right? <clears throat> but that's what a cubic will look like. And so it does have some basic information. The domain, it does go left forever down here, and it does go to the right forever up there. So the domain is negative infinity to infinity. It does go down forever and then up forever. So the range would be negative infinity to infinity. The function is odd. If I were to reflect this part, whatever's in quadrant one, and I were to reflect it over the x, the y-axis, it would look something like this. I know I draw horribly, but it would look something like that, right? Then if I took that and flipped it over the x-axis, it would land here, wouldn't it, okay? The fact that it landed on the other part of the graph means that it is symmetric, okay? And when it's over the y and then over the x, that's what makes it um, symmetric with respect to the origin. It also makes it an odd function, which is what they were saying up there. Right, okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So then it also has a y-intercept of zero, zero. And it does increase on the whole way, right? The whole time it's increasing. So that's the interval for increasing. So that's the cubic function. So keep going. Now we're gonna do the square root. So the square root has the domain. Can you plug in negative numbers in there? No. So automatically the domain is gonna be from zero and everything positive. You cannot plug in negative numbers in there. And when you take the square root of positive numbers, you're going to also end up with positive numbers. It does have the intercept at zero, zero, and it is increasing over the entire graph. That's what it looks like. So we start here and then it just goes outward. It looks like half a parabola that has been turned on the side, right? So instead of having a regular parabola like this, it's basically turned on its side, but only the top half, okay? You can't have the bottom half because you can't plug in negative numbers. <coughs> dun, dun, dun. So then now we have the reciprocal function. It looks like one over X. And this domain is interesting because you can't plug in zero in a fraction, right? You can't have zero at the bottom. So what happens is, is your domain basically has a hole in the graph at zero. So it's just parentheses there. Zero is not included in your domain. Everything else is just not the zero. And when you plug in Y values, I mean, X values, when I plug in X values, if I can plug in super, super, super big X values, I will get really, really, really close to zero, like really close. If I do 1 billion, that's like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? Okay. It's real close to zero, but it will never actually equal zero, no matter what I plug down in the bottom. Okay. 
So that's why the range is also the same thing pretty much as the domain. So I could plug in super big numbers. The closer I get to infinity, the closer that that value as a whole will get to zero. Okay. The function is odd. If I flip it over the y-axis and then flip it over the x-axis, it does land on itself, which is the same thing as saying that it's symmetric with respect to the origin. Those are the same statements. The graph does not have any x-intercepts because remember, it can't equal zero, right? And it does increase on the left side and then, oh no, it just decreases everywhere, actually. Okay, that's what it looks like. So notice that if I trace it from left to right, this is decreasing, right? And if I trace it up here, this is also decreasing. So it's decreasing on the entire domain. There is an imaginary line here, which we will talk about more when we get to the next unit. We talk about fractions some more. Um, in that section, they talk about this invisible line because we told you that the it will never equal zero. So this will get really close to that y-axis, but it will never actually touch the y-axis. Same thing here. It'll get really close to the x-axis, but it will never actually touch the x-axis. And it's the same on this side and down here. Okay. The fact that I can never cross this red line makes that red line special and it has a name. This red line is called the vertical asymptote. And we will learn a lot about those later, okay? But it does have a name. And this horizontal line, which happens to be on top of the y-axis, this line is special also, that is called the horizontal asymptote. Those will move depending on what you do to that basic function. Okay? The, the horizontal line could move up or down, and that vertical line could move to the left or move to the right. Okay? It just depends on what you're doing to the graph. There's some more that are missing. Okay, We've done the constant function. We've done the identity function. We've done the square root function. This is what the absolute value function looks like. It looks like a V. So if you see those bars on your function, you already know that the graph is going to look like a V. Okay. Now, all it is is a regular line, and they flip that part up to make it positive, right? Isn't that what the absolute value does? It takes a negative x values and it makes them positive, right? So it makes sense that all it does is just flip that half to go positive. We know our squared function, our quadratic function is like this. We know our cubic function is like that. And now we know our reciprocal function is like this. There is one more that is very common and that's the um, cube root. They did not talk about this one, but it is also another common one. And it looks like a chair, but it's like on the side. Just in case you see one in your work, in your homework or anything, I don't want it to be completely foreign. Okay. It has an x intercept of zero, zero, the whole thing. It's just completely increasing the whole time, isn't it? Okay. It is odd, right? Because if I flip this over and then flip it over again, it lands on itself, right? All those other same bits of information they were saying before. Um, I think that's pretty much all we've got there. And then we already know that a piecewise function is just basically taking pieces of each of those graphs and putting them together into one. And so the only practice problem they have here is for you to sketch this graph. We do not have enough time to sketch this graph. So we will do it in the next class, okay? You may be able to do some of that homework assignment. You may want to table it until the finish. Okay.
But you guys have a great weekend, and I will see you Monday. Mm -hmm.